Great. And so I'm going to just give you a little background on this Anita Cameron, and I'm going to ask her to chime in as well. Um, Anita Cameron has been an activist, um, bar none, um, and an advocate for people with disabilities on many levels. She has worked with um, Not Dead Yet, been the uh, project director for Not Dead Yet for many years, um, and has just done phenomenal amounts of work. And I know, Anita, that I'm not serving you justice here with this, um, <laughs> with, my, with my bit of um, introducing you. And I know JD would have done a much better job than I could have ever done on this, but just wanting to welcome you into this space and thank you for being with us today and just open up the conversation, Anita, with just having you tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about your history and the work that you have done. Okay, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Anita Cameron. Uh, my pronouns are she, hers. And um, let me give you a visual description. I'm like a caramel colored, uh, skin colored black woman with uh, very long locks. Um, they're tied back. Um, and I am against a white background uh, because I'm in my room and I'm actually wearing a t-shirt with black lettering that says not dead yet. Um, I am director of minority outreach for not dead yet. Um, and I'm actually right after this uh, panel, I'm actually going into a conference um, and uh, being on a panel uh, for not dead yet at the National Council on Independent Living. Um, conference today. So a little about me. Ah, well, um, my joke, <laughs> and, and, and JD wanted me to tell it, but my joke is, is that when someone looks in the dictionary under the word intersectional or intersectionality, they'll see my picture <laughs> because I am a disabled black lesbian living in relative poverty. And so I am at the intersection of a number of uh, oppressions and marginalizations. Um, I have both apparent and non-apparent disabilities. Um, I was born uh, with my disabilities. Um, and uh, so, um, well, um, you know, I was born with disabilities and then at a young age, uh, discovered that I was a lesbian. And um, I didn't know, at four years old, I did not know the word lesbian. I just knew that I, liked girls and that one day when I grew up, I was gonna marry a girl. And that in fact happened. I've been married to my lovely wife for 12 years now. And we've been together 14 years. Dating, you know, it's, it, it, when you're disabled, you know, that's a, a kind of a charged, thing when you're disabled and you're dating, you're trying to date because, um, you know, on the one hand, you know, some folks feel like, okay, you're not a, well, disabled people shouldn't have sex. Mm -hmm. Disabled people shouldn't date, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and they have this idea, um, and it's a, it's a two-pronged idea. Mm -hmm. One is, um, oh, you ought to be glad somebody wants you. And, and I was actually told that um, when I kind of rejected advances of a gentleman, um, uh, he told me, you ought to be glad somebody wants you. You know, so that um, 
when you're going out with the disabled person, it's kind of a mercy thing or a feel sorry for thing. Or to be real honest, and we're adults here, um, a situation where, ooh, what, 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 what's disabled, you know, like, you know, what's it like? Is the um, yum yum any different than, you know, a non-disabled? Mm. Um, but then on the other hand, you get these people that feel as if um, if a non-disabled person dates a disabled person, it's either a caregiver thing um, or they're a creep, like they're a child molester. Mm -hmm. Because we disabled people get infantilized so much, mm -hmm. you know, that we're seen to be children. And so if a non-disabled person dates a disabled person, then it's, and, I, and I've heard this, and I've seen and experienced this, that you, you must be some kind of child molester out there wanting to take advantage of. Um, and so, you know, oftentimes, you know, we as disabled people wind up kind of dating other disabled folks, mm -hmm. um, you know, because at least you don't have that kind of, of ableism, you know, but, you know, it kind of depends. Like I said, I'm, I'm a lesbian and there's lots of ableism in the lesbian community, in the LGBTQ community as a whole. Um, and there's a lot of racism. And then you get into, you know, I'm, I'm black and there's a lot of ableism in the black community and even among, you know, black LGBTQ folks. So it's almost like, well, well, what do you do, you know? Um, and so um, I'm a disability rights activist. I have been a social justice activist since I was 16 years old. I am 56 years old. So social justice activist for 40 years. And I've been a disability rights activist for 20, uh, 35 years um, and have done LGBTQ uh, work for about 38 years. Um, and so it's, uh, most of my life was involved, you know, I'm much more well known for my activism in the disability community, um, you know, really deep in the movement, um, you know, arrested 139 times over 35 years for nonviolent civil disobedience um, and direct action. And I had decided, you know, I had a couple of partners, you know, over the years, but we didn't, you know, and I decided that I would be married to the movement, mm. that I was going to be a, you know, a spinster or a cat lady um, and an activist. And that's just the way it was going to be. Mm -hmm. And then I went to Washington, D.C., you know, on my regular ADAPT actions. And we had taken over the um, Senate finance chambers, um, trying to get them to um, uh, uh, support and to um, have a hearing on our piece of legislation that will allow people with disabilities who are uh, incarcerated in nursing homes uh, to live uh, free in the community with services and supports they need. Mm -hmm. And so we had taken over, and I am known in, in ADAPT as a chanter and a singer. And I was going around, you know, singing, we who believe in freedom will not rest until it comes. Mm -hmm. You know, singing, walking around, and we, you know, sang this song for about a good 45 minutes. And at the time, I was living in Colorado. Um, and I will pass by my buddies from the Rochester chapter. And the thing about the Rochester chapter of a dad back then, I would say about 98% of these folks were gay and mostly lesbians. And I'm, you know, going around, I noticed this lady in an orange baseball cap. And I keep going around singing, but I'm minding my own business. Um, I was arrested that day as well as the lady in the orange cap. Um, and so we went on our way and there were other protests and she was there. And I got to looking, you know, for 
the lady in the orange cap because I didn't even know her name. And I was too. Uh, see, the thing is, is that in the disability rights movement, my big mouth and everything, people don't realize that I'm incredibly shy. Um, I'm autistic. And so I'm very, very shy. And I was, you know, friends, you know, buddies, you know, with the folks from Rochester. But I was too scared to ask, what's her name? And we were way, you know, and whatnot. Well, um, she showed up in 2004. In 2006, I actually got offered a job in Rochester um, at a SEAL called Center for Disability Rights. A, a SEAL is a Center for Independent Living. And these are non-residential uh, non places that are ran by people with disabilities, for people with disabilities. Um, they do advocacy, they do um, uh, a, a number of things uh, for people with disabilities. And so I was hired as a systems advocate. Mm -hmm. I started work. My boss took me around to, you know, upstairs and downstairs to introduce me to people. And lo and behold, there was the woman with the orange cap. Now, long story short, I still didn't get her name. I found out her name by accident in 2007. Um, we went to another action in Chicago, and she finally came up to me and asked me, are you gay? I said, yes. Um, she says, um, I think you're cute. I think you're cute, and I think you're cool, and we should hang out sometime. Well, I didn't realize at the time that she was flirting with me. Okay. okay. Didn't didn't uh -huh. even I, I didn't even know. I just thought she was being nice. Mm -hmm. Um and uh, you know, so we found ourselves to, you know, thrown together, um, but didn't I didn't think anything of it. We got back home to Rochester. Um, and about a month later, um, she came to me and said, you know, I never got your phone number. Um let's chat. And I said, sure. So I gave her my phone number. Um, we chatted. Her first question to me was, do you like cats? I said, oh my goodness, I love kitties. Mm -hmm. And then we um, decided to go on a date. We were going to go to um, an Italian restaurant, but it was all packed. And I found out that she was a keeper because she looked at me and said, do you like Ethiopian food? Okay. And I said, oh, my goodness, yes. Um, and, um, you know, I didn't expect that she would like Ethiopian food. It just so happens that Lisa happens to be white, um, Irish lady, very um, uh, 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 in some ways conservative, you know, but um, real sweet and in she never gave any indication that she would love like something that I really love. So we went uh, to the Abyssinian, the Ethiopian restaurant, and we were there for hours talking and chatting and everything. And I knew that after that, we were going to be kind of inseparable. Our next date was a drive to Let's Work State Park to see the foliage change, because that's what I was used to in Colorado. Mm -hmm. um, and so we went to see the foliage change and everything. And we had such a good time. And um, when she dropped me off at my house, um, she stole a kiss. I, I, I told my friend that I stole the kiss, but she told her friend that she stole the kiss. And looking back later, I believe she probably did steal the kiss. Um, but you know, from then on, it, it, there's a joke that in the, among lesbians, you know, you have your first date and then the second date to U-Haul because you're moving in. Um, well, our fourth or fifth date was a U-Haul. <laughs> um, we moved into my house in February. February. Mm -hmm. um, in April of that year, she proposed to me. And of course I said, yes. Um, in April of 2009, April 3rd of 2009, we went to Canada and we got officially married. And so we've been married for 12 years now, um, almost 12 and a half, but we've been together for 14 years. And so that's, you know, been kind of my story 
you know, about my kind of uh, dating experience, you know, yeah, that dating experience. Now, you know, um, my, my first partner, um, I also met her through disability activism. Um, and my second partner, I met through disability activism and my third partner, but it didn't really work out, you mm. know, for a number of reasons, um, some being kind of lateral ableism and whatnot. But, um, you know, this, what Lisa has, has remained, Lisa herself is disabled, she's deaf. Um, I have almost no eyesight. Um, so Lisa says, well, I'm, you know, Lisa is extremely hard of hearing. So um, she's fluent in ASL and I've been learning ASL uh, because I used to work with a gentleman uh, who was uh, back in Chicago, my hometown, who happened to be um, deaf blind and used a wheelchair. So, you know, I knew some rudimentary uh, ASL. I was involved in protests to get a deaf president at Gallaudet University in Washington, D.C. Um, and so, you know, uh, so yeah, so I kind of had that. So Lisa says to people, I'm deaf and she's blind and we make a perfect couple. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so um, Lisa is woke in that way that, you know, I can talk to her about um, issues of being a black woman mm -hmm. um, and the racial, you know, um, reckoning and issues that's, you know, coming out now. Um, there is, we're, you know, we have our problems. We have our ups and downs as, as most couples do, but, um, you know, we have that trust and we have that love and we have that, that dedication and devotion to each other. And, um, you know, that's just kind of the way, uh, that's kind of the way it is. I mean, not all disabled people have that love story, you know, that I have, but a lot of them do because we do date and we do have sex and we, you know, we are sexy and we're hot and we're, you know, uh, we're all that, you know? And um, I wish that more um, non-disabled people could see that, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of non-disabled people think, well, you know, I'd kind of rather be dead than be like you, or they come into, you know, the relationship wants to be a helper or a carer. And it's like, no, 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 no. You know, if I if I want a helper or a carrier, I will go to a home health care agency and get an attendant. You are my wife and my lover and my partner. Now, some people, you know, they have that relationship, you know, where they are attendants. And if that's what the person wants, that's fine. Um, it's kind of like not like that for me. But I'm going to um, chill here. And, um, you know, uh, if there are other questions or- if oh, I do, I do. Come... You struck up some really, really good top some points here that I would like to talk more about, to, you know, hear more about you from. So you talked about knowing about your sexuality at four years old and, mm -hmm. you know, like, and maybe people not recognizing yet. What would you say to other people with disabilities who have that recognition and who might be afraid um, what like what would you say to them if they if they know their sexuality and people other people don't want to recognize it what would be your advice to them well i think right now you know i would say just be true to yourself you know when i was growing up i did not speak mm -hmm. of my sexuality my friends my little friends when i was four and five years old they were the ones who noticed and they you know say things like, you know, um, I have a twin sister um, and they would say things like, oh yeah, when you grow up, Yvette's gonna be the woman and Anita, you're gonna be the man because that's kind of what, you know, they saw it, but you know, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not trans and, and, you know, I'm cisgendered. And so, you know, I, I you know, I'm a woman. I, that feel that in my body and all, um, but 
But, you know, I came out on my 21st birthday in 1986, shortly before I joined the disability rights movement. And um, I remember this was, you know, gay bashing was mm -hmm. a real thing mm -hmm. back then. And, um, you know, I remember my friend and I, we weren't even partners and lovers, you know, she was just like a big sister, you know, who helped me navigate, you know, the, the LGBT community and whatnot. And we were in, you know, we came out of this lesbian bar and were surrounded by men who beat us up and, you know, whatnot and followed us, you know, on the bus and all. And it was really scary, you know. And so even when I, you know, was with my partner, I was reluctant to show like affection in public, you know, to like kiss on the cheek or hold hands because I was afraid that we would be, you know, gay bashed again. And unfortunately, even in like, I mean, that still happens, but mm -hmm. being, you know, being gay is far more accepted. And so I would say folks coming out now, mm -hmm. you know, just be yourself, you know, um, and um, get involved in, um, you know, when, when I was in Colorado, because one of the things that I did was, you know, I helped, um, to get a no discrimination ordinance in Chicago, Illinois, mm -hmm. and in Denver, Colorado. Um, but when I was in Denver, one of the things I had to do was to form a, uh, a disability, you know, uh, kind of like a support group for disabled LGBTQ folks. Mm -hmm. um, and so almost every large city has a, you know, has a, a you know, a, a community center for mm -hmm. LGBTQ. Unfortunately, a lot of times you have physical access issues. Right. And so in Denver, you know, the most successful city in the country, we didn't have that issue with our center. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, um, with, um, you know, with, with, with the LGBTQ community being, you know, largely ableist, you know, um, even with Rochester having the largest uh, number of deaf people per capita in the United States, mm -hmm. we still have issues with um, signage and sign language, you know, for deaf people at events. We still, you know, have issues with events being held at inaccessible venues, so people who use wheelchairs can't really get in. But if you're lucky enough to live in a city where the LGBTQ community is welcoming and their spaces are accessible, you know, hook up with them. Otherwise, if you know, you know, other LGBTQ disabled folks, set up something yourself. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's in your in your house or you know, um, in, in, a, in a park, in a place that's accessible that, you know, you can chill, you know, because there's, you know, it, it, dating and being disabled and being, you know, straight, you know, um, and, or cis is one thing, but when you add, you know, dating and disability and LGBTQ, you know, or being trans or non-binary, then you have another, I think a lot of times we disabled folks, um, especially those of us who are LGBTQ, we just, we have to set these things up ourselves. Mm -hmm. You know, we have to, um, you know, to create space mm -hmm. for ourselves. And maybe one of these days we won't have to do that anymore, but for now, Unfortunately, we do. Wow, that's amazing, Anita. I heard you say something earlier. You talked about how, you know, seeing yourself as sexy and, and, and those different things. Now, because people normally don't recognize people with disabilities as sexy, what would you say to people who, you know, like, you know, what, how, how would you tell people to, to view themselves or how can we change that message so that people do see people with disabilities as one, being sexual, and then encouraging them to, you know, let people know that it's okay. People with disabilities are sexy. Like what, 
what, what, what do yeah, you Yeah, because like that? a lot of people with disabilities who see themselves as sexual and want to, um, you know, get on out there, a lot of times too, here's the thing, people who are non-disabled will see us as, oh, you're perverts, you're weird, especially if you're a guy. Mm -hmm. Oh, you're weird, you're a pervert, you, you know, and we have to get rid of those, um, we have to get rid of those narratives and we have to see the beauty in ourselves. And a lot of times that's hard because, you know, especially if you are unconventional or you, you know, have, um, you know, uh, yeah, unconventional looks, if you will, mm -hmm. um, you still sexy, you still got it, you know, and if you think that, I you know, that, Anita. <laughs> I love you that. You got to get that in your mind. You got yes. to look in the mirror, you know, because for all of my life, I thought that I was plain or even ugly, you mm -hmm. know, but I'm not and I'm sexy. And my wife tells me I'm sexy all the time. And I had to figure out, OK, so what's sexy, you know, and because it's not always the twerking or the, mm -hmm. you know, scanty clothes or whatnot. Um, there's a lot of personality that goes into what's considered sex, sexy, you know, and if you got that, you know, if you got that attitude. Yeah, you know, I got that. That's there's sexiness, you know, in that, you know, without, you know, being all conceited and whatnot, but just to know that you're beautiful, even if other people don't think you're beautiful, you are beautiful. There is, you know, there is cuteness out there. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, the eye of the beholder. And, you know, cuteness is cuteness. And if you think you cute and you know you cute, mm -hmm. you know, it's it's gonna come out, mm -hmm. you know, um in in ways, you know, but it is true that you know when you're disabled, you know, there's a lot more struggle in seeing yourself as, um, you know, uh, being physically, you know, when, I mean, there are pretty disabled people out there, don't get me wrong, I mean, drop dead, you know, but most of us are ordinary and look ordinary, you know, just like, in, or, in, or we have, like I said, unconventional uh, looks or whatnot, but we, we still cute. You know, I don't care if our bodies are twisted, you know, or whatnot. Some people have disabilities where their bodies are twisted, you know, or, um, you know, the facial muscles don't work much. So there's, you know, um, some drooling or whatnot, but, you know, that, whatever, you still, you know, you still boxing, sexy, you mm -hmm. know, a MILF, <laughs> if you will. We're all adults here. Uh -huh. Um we still, we still got it, got it. And we, you know, we just have to believe as disabled people that we got it, got it, that mm -hmm. we're worthy of, um, you know, of, of dating and being sexual and all, or even just there are a lot of people out there who are ace, they're asexual, but they still may want some, you know, non-romantic, you know, company, you know, or whatnot. But for those of us who really want that romance and that sex, you know, um, we deserve it, you mm -hmm. know, and we just, you know, need to, um, we need to get on out there and, and, and do our thing. Um, I'm about to have some technical issues. I'm going to do my phone. I'm hoping that it doesn't, um, I hope that it doesn't, but if it does, I'll hop back in. Yeah. Okay, not a problem, not a problem at all. Anita, I, I love your, I love what you said about seeing yourself as beautiful. And that is not something that we often see, like, you know, uh oh, we, I think we lost her. We'll give her a minute to come back in. And at this time, if anybody has any questions that they would like to ask in the chat, we can, you can start posing some of those in the chat as we wait for Anita to come back. You can definitely do that. How's everybody doing so far? Can you guys let me know in the chat how you're doing? Is everybody doing okay? Great, thank you, thank you, D. Thank you, thank you, thank you, jo Jocelyn. Thank you, M. Thank you. 
Okay, Jocelyn, I like that. I like what you said. Um, I work for a faith-based community. How do I introduce them to disability rights concepts without overwhelming them? Um, and you, I'm glad to hear you're doing great. And then we have a question about what is ableism? So these are definitely questions that we will um, pose to Anita when she gets back. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's been a day for technical difficulties. I've encountered them myself through some things that happened at my home. So um, it's been a day for that, but I'm glad you guys are hanging in there with us and let's just give it a few more minutes. Um, another minute, you know, and waiting for um, Anita to rejoin us. I know she'll be rejoining us soon. And this is a good time if you need to step away and take a break, grab a drink, feel free to do so. Um, but we will be starting back up, we will be. Just waiting on Anita. Let's see, nope, she's not back yet. I love that, uh, D. We are all beautifully made. We are all people, and it's wonderful to hear um, Anita and share her love for love. I love that comment. And if anyone wants to unmute themselves, I don't have to read your comments. Feel free to do so at this time. Feel free if anyone would like to have anything to say. But I love what's happening in the chat. Thank you. We are queerfully and wonderfully made. Nice, M. Nice. <laughs> I like that a lot. Really nice. Nice. I love that. Wonderful. We do apologize for this. And I know Anita will be joining. She will be coming back on any second now. Yeah, I had to move churches because I I went from Cafe to Spiritus Christi Church. You went to Spiritus Christi. Wow. Oh, Have you heard of that? Yes, I have. Yes, I have. And can you tell me a little, you, do you want to share a little bit about why you moved? You don't have uh, to, your choice. I, yeah, I will, because they, they don't, then it's because they don't, they don't, they don't, they're not that nice to LGBTQ. Okay. And because they did, they, they, the one time they had a mask for people with special needs. And they're telling us that we're sick. Like, kind of, what was it? You explain. Oh. You do. We, we, we thought it was a mass to celebrate, you know, to celebrate disabilities. Because they said it was a celebration of disabilities. But it turned out there's probably some people who had some, some, some sicknesses along with that. And, and I brought my kids thinking, okay, this would be great. And, and it was more like they were blessing them because they were, they were sick. And well, we're not sick. But you're not sick. So, but some people are, so maybe they wanted to get blessed, right? Wow. Yeah. Yes. Thank you so much for sharing that. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> I'm back. I'm sorry about that. I had some technical issues. That's okay. We got some questions that came up for you. And M had an awesome uh, comment that he shared. He said, we are queerfully and wonderfully made. Um, and we also had some other comments. Um, one question that we do have in the chat was, I wanna make sure I get them all. I don't wanna miss them. Um, how can parents, family members support their loved ones with disabilities who are trying to navigate? Let me move my chat box down some. Uh, just wanna move this, move my chat box down some. Who are trying to navigate their sexuality and dating and mating life. So how can parents, family members support their loved ones with disabilities who are trying to navigate their sex, sexuality and dating lives? I think um, just, you know, supporting them. Um, I didn't tell my birth parents you know, about my sexuality or anything like that. Um, but I got adopted at age 18. 
And my adoptive family was so supportive, you know. And <laughs> sometimes, sometimes my mom would like, you know, try to be that matchmaker, you know, see, see you know, some, you know, a pretty lesbian and she'll say, my, you know, my daughter's a lesbian. You, you, you should meet my daughter. My daughter is fine, <laughs> you know. But she, you know, I lost my mom this year on February 1st, but she, um, wasn't able to get to Canada to see Lisa and I married, but she, uh, we sent her a CD of it and she loved it and she put it around and just be, you know, just be proud of your, you know, of your child, but kind of follow their direction, you know, if you will, mm -hmm. um, in the things that they want and whatnot, see if, they want to be, you know, kind of hooked up, see if, you know, they want to like deal with, you know, dating apps or stuff like that, you know, um, just support and just like um, kind of follow your child's, you know, guidance, you know, on that, you know, especially when, you um, you know, um, when, like, if they're teens, um, you know, uh, th there's a kind of a protection that you need to do, you know, but, you know, when they're adults and all, you know, support them, follow their guidance, ask, you know, questions, um, you know, uh, just, you know, all of that, like I said, my, my, adopted parents you know was so so um so so supportive and it you know disability didn't it didn't matter you know um it, they wanted you know my mom was like you're my you're my kid you're my daughter and I want to see you happy and I support you you know and all of that you know and their fears but try not to be too controlling like I said try to let that person you know, um, kind of get out there on their own, but then, you know, be supportive if things don't necessarily go well and, you know, whatnot, but don't make it scare you into not wanting to, you know, have your child date. I mean, it's just like, you know, in a way like non-disabled, you know, um, parents, and then, you know, work on the assumption that your child's going to be independent. Mm -hmm. that your child may not be living with you, that okay. they, you know, most likely will live in their own places with services and support that they need. Um, and so, you know, just, you know, kind of look at it that. And, and a lot of times just non-disabled parents see their disabled adult children as kids. You know, you can go around and say, well, some parents say, oh, you can, you can live to be 99, 99 years old. You're going to always be my baby. Mm -hmm. But there are different nuances like that when it comes to disabled people, because mm -hmm. we tend to get infantilized anyway. Mm -hmm. But that's kind of what I'm saying. Support, you know, get out there with them, but, you know, let them, let them lead the way. Absolutely. You have more questions in the chat. Um, Kimberly asked, are there resources and programs for teens with autism to teach them who it is appropriate to pursue relationships with? Um, it's like specifically if they're showing interest for younger children because they do not fully understand the age difference. So are there resources mm -hmm. to help teens with that? You know, there's a group called um, Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. And they are a group of autistic people. It's a group for autistic people ran by autistic people. And okay. they have all kinds of, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, so Google them. And then there's a group called Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. And I'm pretty sure that they've got resources too. You can Google them as well. Wow, thanks. Those are the two groups I know don't don't even mess around with autism speaks because they look at autistic folks as scary and you know kidnapped and all that they, most 
autistic advocates and activists see them as a hate group. So definitely check out Autistic Self-Advocacy Network. They're known as ASAN, A-S-A-N, or the um, Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network. Um, and, and yeah, they definitely, they think that lots of stuff you know, out there and definitely check them out. Great. Okay. We have one more question, Anita. It says, um, I work for a faith-based community. How do I introduce, how do I, how do I introduce them to disability rights concepts without overwhelming them? So, Let's see, faith-based. faith-based communities. And a lot of times, you know, like churches and stuff um, are exempt from being wheelchair accessible Mm. under the EA because they, you know, um, a lot of churches have built ramps into their churches, you know, because they want to do outreach, you know, to their folks. Um, you know, especially if, you know, and there's a lot of, you know, in the faith-based community, you know, there's a lot of whatever is with LGBTQ, you know, sometimes and sometimes not, but I think that, um, you know, and then some, some agencies, um, some churches may not believe in people dating, you know, and whatnot, or being sexual and whatnot before marriage. So, but if you find that you're in kind of a, a you know, a, a, I think it's a matter of, talking to the pastor or mm -hmm. talking to the priest, you know, or your rabbi and, you know, sitting down, you know, or your imam, you know, and sitting down with them, you know, and saying, look, um, you know, how do we do this in a, you know, in a manner that's consistent, you know, with our faith. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it might be that, you know, you, they may work on like, how to kind of set something like that, offer, you know, them to say, look, can we, can we kind of have a group to kind of talk about this, you know, um, with our disabled folks, our disabled parishioners and having them lead, centering them, you know, and knowing and understanding, you know, you got to understand sexuality is normal. It's a human thing. Yeah. And disabled people deserve to get married and start families and all just like non-disabled people. And there are many disabled people out there who have families, who have children, who have given birth to children or they adopt children and it can be done. You know, um, I think it's just a matter of sitting down with the leadership, you know, of your, you know, of your faith, you know, um, and, and having those conversations, you know, um, and, um, you know, that's a way, you know, to get people in, you know, to bring people in, you know, to, to the faith, if you're supporting them, you know, um, they're more likely to stay, but you know, a lot of times you got to get over that ableism because a lot of faith communities see mm -hmm. disability as you're, um, you're flawed or someone committed a sin or you're unclean. And so you have to, you know, get rid of those old fashioned ableist, you know, thoughts about disabled people and be really, really welcoming. Yeah. Anita, I love that you said that. M shared with us earlier that he um, was at a, another church, but now was at Spiritus Christi because they were more welcoming um, and, and, and the way that he was treated there. So I, I loved um, M's comment. M, I, I hope I'm not stealing your thunder. Do you want to share your comment with Anita again? Yes. So, so I, you, I, I live in Fairport and I go to St. John of Rochester Church, and is it's not very, it's not very diverse. It's kind of all white people are straight. All white people are straight, and and you know what? And 
and they're, I mean, they're nice, but they don't accept, they're very nice, but they don't accept, like, the gay marriage, and they, I think they kind of baby me a little bit sometimes, and so then, and then they, they, they we were, we were at the mass for people with special needs, but they, they said we were, they, they, it wasn't a sorry, we were just all sick. So what was that? What was that? They didn't just bless you because they, they thought some people might have had some sickness. But we're not sick. No. Yeah. So, I, so I moved to Spiritus. Have you heard that church, Anita? I've heard of Spiritus, and they, they are very diverse, and they are very accepting. And the thing about it is, here's the deal. Largely, people with disabilities are not sick. We are healthy as horses. Even those of us who have, I mean, I have a number of conditions. I have diabetes, I have MS, um, I have um, ataxia, I have epilepsy, you know, and all, but I'm not sick. However, there are people with disabilities who are sickly, um, who have chemical sensitivities, who are uh, bed born because they cannot leave their beds or their houses but whether you're sick you know or sickly or ill or whether you're not you know or whether you feel that you know you're not you are still deserving of, yeah. to have good healthy uh, relationships good healthy sexual relationships and I know Pastor, Pastor Maya, I think out of uh, 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 Spiritus, yep. like I said, those folks are really nice and they, they're diverse and they are accepting. Um, uh, yeah, I'm familiar with, I think Pastor Meyer uh, was voted a change maker uh, here in Rochester. And as a matter yeah. of fact, uh, I am a change maker um, as well. And a couple of folks that I know. So I'm glad you hooked up with Spiritus. They're really, really cool. Yeah. And the, the, the music is way better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, it's like the clapping and like that. Yeah, yeah, it, like they tend to be more exuberant, I think. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, a little more emotional. I grew up Catholic. Um, and so... Um, you know, we tend to be less exuberant Do in our mind? worship. Um, and so, yeah. Wonderful. Thank you so much, M, for sharing. We have a comment that I'm going to read, Anita. It says, I would suggest people evaluate their politics to ensure they align with their love support of their disabled LGBTQ loved ones. If you want to truly support the ones you love, you have to look at the whole picture. I have observed many disconnects in the reference to this. And unfortunately, words aren't enough to ensure your loved ones are safe, ensured rights, provided and provided necessary resources. Thank you so much, Jocelyn. And that was a comment in the chat. So we are down to the last four minutes. Anita, um, I know my colleague JD has joined us. JD Flores has joined us. She her, she was having some difficulties. Um, so just before, you know, I'm gonna give a, a, Anita last words. JD, is there anything you'd like to ask, comment, say, please let us know. No, I mean, I'm so happy everyone is here. Thank you, Anita, so much, big sis. I really, really appreciate um, you being here and you sharing your wisdom and your stories with us um, that is of the utmost importance to me that you know our voices get heard and so I appreciate you so much um, I would just reiterate what's been going on in the chat that we do have an evaluation for this please you know everyone fill it out so that we can continue to do workshops like this in the future um, and just to add on to some of Anita's comments earlier I would say that you know when unpacking disability and when talking about it I think the first step really to ease into it is to really talk about it. It's just, just bring it to light. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people never talk about it. They never say the word disabled out loud. They never talk about people with disabilities. It doesn't, it doesn't flow into the natural conversation of anything. So really just, if you have the opportunity, just talk about it. And it's not, like, not in a way to kind of educate, 
but more so in a way to talk about us like we're general people, like part of the regular, regular population. And, you know, that we are a part of the makeup of human society, that we are productive citizens, that we do have value and worth. And so I think you can start it off in that small amount way. I'm a firm believer that one conversation can change a lot of different things. So um, really, I think that first step is just to mention it and just to talk about it out loud, because there's a lot of things that we leave unsaid. And I, I think that that would be my only bit that I would add. Thank you so much, JD. I'm going to give it to Miss Anita for parting words because she, she, she just, Anita, I, I'm, I'm, I, I love everything about what you said today. Like, I mean, I, the, the conversation starter, seeing yourself as beautiful and sexy and looking at personality. I mean, absolutely wonderful words of advice and just, just so resourceful. So I'm going to give it to you for the last two minutes. Anything you'd like to add or say just before we close out? I think that, um, that we have to, you know, we have to see ourselves, you know, is that we have to see ourselves, you know, as ordinary folks, we have to talk, you know, sometimes, you know, this dating thing or lack of dating thing, it may cause people to be sad or depressed and then they want to go to a therapist and stuff like that. Um, first off, a lot of times that's hard because a lot of therapists don't even understand people with disabilities or therapy uh, uh, therapist offices are inaccessible or they don't know how to deal with you if you have, say, if you're non-speaking, you know, but, um, and, and if they're, you know, therapists seem to, well, you know, it's okay that you are depressed because you're disabled and you want, you know, whatever, when that's not true. Um, they have to value us as people, um, you know, um, and we val have to value ourselves as people. And um, like JD was saying, you know, those conversations about disability because a lot of times people don't want to say the word or they want to whisper it you know um or they want to you know it's it's interesting how people want to come up to you and ask you all kinds of inappropriate questions that they would not ask a stranger like one time i got asked was my did my junk work you know because i went to the store and i bought some feminine products you know and i got asked did my junk work and it's like mm. would you to yours you know right. <laughs> um right <laughs> and so a lot of times you know you got to approach that stuff with a little humor but still you know out there saying that we as disabled people we are gorgeous we are worthy we 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 you know we are productive members of society um we are you know we're we're sexy we're cute you know, we got it, got it. Don't matter how we look conventional or others, there's beauty in all of us and we got it. And we just gotta, you know, strut our stuff on out there and put ourselves on, you know, on out there, you know, um, and, 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 and be adventurous, you know, and sometimes things fail. And when it fails, don't think it's because of your disability or anything. Don't let nobody gaslight you like that, you know, you know just, kind of work through it and then put yourself back on out there and you will find, look, I had given up on finding love. You know, I was gonna be, you know, married to the movement. And it was weird because when I gave up on it, love found me. Yeah. And like I said, I've been married 12 years and, um, you know, it's not gonna always be, oh, you know, I mean, you, you have arguments and discussions and things like that, but that's normal. You know, most of the time it's normal. You know, you, you'll figure out real quick when somebody is gaslighting you or abusing you and get yourself out of that situation. One important thing, don't feel like you got to take abuse from somebody just because you disabled, you know, just because that person may have an idea of, oh, you lucky somebody wants you. You don't have to take abuse. You don't deserve abuse. And if you see that happen in a relationship, nope out of that real, real quick. You know, because we as disabled people, we're worth it. And like I said, we worth it. We got it, got it. We're sexy and we don't have to endure abuse. And we can have 
beautiful relationships and supportive relationships. Anita, thank you so much for today. Thank you. Thank you for your everything. And a comment already, my words, thank you so much, Joyce, your insight, your honesty, and your wisdom. Um, that came from Joyce Still, and I echo that 100%. Um, thank you so much. I thank you all for being here today. I hope you guys, I hope you all will join us. Um, our next session will be on dating and disability. That will be a panel discussion. That will be August 26. Um, and you again have thank yous from M in the um in, in the chat box. So thank you all so much. We look forward to seeing you in our next session. Have a wonderful afternoon. Thank you so much, Miss Anita. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor and a pleasure. Absolutely. Thank you for being here so much, big sis. I really am so appreciative of you. Um, and you know, I told you once I found you, I wasn't letting you go. <laughs> well, this was so exciting, and it's a conversation that needs to be, you know, to need to be talked about. And so I'm I'm honored that y'all, you know, asked me to be a part of this. And um, I was so excited, and I just hope that you know. I, I was able to give out good information and all and, and thank you all for listening and hearing, you know, and asking questions and all. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you all. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. You too. Thanks.